Margarita Shinas, welcome to 7.30. Thank you for having me, Sarah. Is there urgent consensus in Europe for the creation of a Palestinian state? Yes, I think this is uh, now coming back uh, in force. This is something that was part of the Oslo agreements, if you would remember, 20 years ago. And uh, somehow uh, the uh, uh, terrorist attack of Hamas on Israel and everything that followed in a way uh, uh, was a blessing in disguise, if I may use this, because it brings back this idea of uh, post-conflict horizon based on security guarantees and this two-state solution, which could be a viable option both for the security of Israel and of the Palestinians. So yes, now is the moment. Uh, let me ask you this, is it possible while Netanyahu remains in power, given his government has promoted the expansion of the settlements in the West Bank so aggressively? I think what we now need is for the dust to settle down, we need to uh, switch from conflict to post-conflict uh, uh, horizons. And once this is the case, then I think with the help of the international community and the European Union will be part of the effort, we will work out a system of guarantees that would allow both for Israel and the Palestinians to live in peace and security regardless of what happened in the past. Now is the moment to look ahead. Notwithstanding, Netanyahu has said that post-conflict, Israel would expect to maintain a security presence in Gaza. Again, is it possible to talk about a post-conflict when Israel is saying it will remain in Gaza in one form or another? In a post-conflict horizon, everything is possible, provided that we find an understanding on the need for Israel and the Palestinians to live in peace and security. This is not rocket science, it's doable. It was part of the design of the Oslo agreements. We lost 20 years, uh, but probably now is the right moment. And in this post-conflict horizon, yes, I believe that everything is possible provided that goodwill prevails from all sides. I want to ask you a little bit about your position in Europe. You're uh, the Vice President for Promoting the Europe European Way of Life. What is that? This is the combination of uh, what one would call a Europe that protects, that means the policies of the European Union that pertain to migration, security, public health, with a Europe of empowerment, which is a Europe of opportunities, mobility, education, culture, skills. For the first time, we bring all this together in a single portfolio, and this is my responsibility in the Commission. How much does the march of far-right, the popularity in march of far-right parties in Europe undermine Europe and democracy? The European Union is a union of democracies. Uh, that's what we are known for. And we are very proud of our democratic systems. We are never afraid of an election result. And we have proven over the years that we can work in bringing together our differences in a tapestry of uh, democracy and prosperity. So we're confident that all political forces would be able to fit in to this new institutional architecture. These are, these are fine words, but let's just look at the reality on the ground. Gert Wilders may not be able to form government, but he topped the polls, the Dutch polls. Viktor Orban, the longest serving leader in Hungary. We have Maloney in Italy. The far right's gaining ground in Germany and France as well. They may not overturn democracy, but you'd accept that they pull politics onto their turf. Yeah, I do accept that. But uh, you fail to mention amongst the uh, examples you just uh, mentioned the case of Poland, where quite the opposite happened. Uh, Donald Tusk, uh, in f as head of a coalition of moderate forces, managed to unseat a populist anti-EU uh, uh, government. So again, 25% of the Dutch voters voted for Gerd Wilders, but 75% didn't. And when a government emerges in the Netherlands, uh, would have to be different from the rhetoric of a party that won the election because there has to be a government coalition. So we will be able to work with everybody in the European Union who is willing to contribute to constructive solutions 
rather than undermining our collective successful, if I may say, project. And yet, at the same time, the most obvious feature that all those parties that I mentioned have in common is their hostility towards immigration, particularly Muslim immigration. How dangerous is that? Well, uh, this is something indeed that should make us uh, think as Europeans, because despite of our overall success, despite of uh, having a biggest single market, uh, the second world currency of reference, uh, we have not managed yet to have a common holistic EU migration and asylum policy. We are getting there, but we are not yet there. Uh, I'm very proud to have proposed a set of proposals for an EU pact for migration and asylum that are now reaching the critical stage of agreement with member states, and I'm confident that this European agreement would be the best possible answer to the fears uh, that you just mentioned. Now, I just want to talk about one of the, um, ex this extraordinary thing that we've seen happen in the UK, an incredible spat, really, where the UK Prime Minister has cancelled a meeting with the Greek Prime Minister, Mr Mitsakakis, because he mentioned, had the temerity to mention on television that Greek would like to get back its treasures from the British Museum, those treasures that were taken from uh, the Parthenon. Now, have you ever seen something so petulant in international diplomacy, and should the Brits give the marbles back? Well, I, uh, news reached me of this incredible uh, situation yesterday night as I, as I landed in, in Canberra, and frankly, I, I know the UK well, I studied in the UK, I, I, I lived there, and it's mind-blowing how uh, a British Prime Minister can uh, reach a stage where he refuses to talk to someone that he disagrees with. That's, that's so un-British. I mean, it's as un-British as it gets. Uh, so I'm, uh, I'm, I'm still lost for words about what happened. And yes, in my mind, there is no doubt that the marbles should go back where they belong, which is the Acropolis Museum and just, in Athens. And just thinking about how, how extraordinary that decision by Rishi Sunak was, let's remember, of course, that Greek is a NATO partner of the UK. Um, what do you think Sunak was doing? Was he appealing to the culture warriors at a time when his party is unpopular? Look, I, uh, since many years, I'm trying to understand the Conservative Party, and uh, frankly, I haven't managed to to find credible explanations of of the decisions that uh, the Conservative Conservative Party took, uh, that basically led to Brexit and led to a sequence of. Uh, unthinkable outcomes, uh, uh, an economy that is not growing, uh, lack of uh, skills, lack of people, lack of NHR resources. Frankly, I'm, I'm not good at explaining the inexplicable. Well, in the meantime, thank you very much indeed for joining us this evening and especially for adding that detail on the Elgin Marbles. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah.